Mustafa, thank you so much for joining us at Giant Ideas. Your new book describes a coming wave of technology that will alter our conception of intelligence and life. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, over the next two decades, we are on the cusp of unleashing what is nothing short of a revolution in artificial intelligence. I mean, everyone in the world is going to get access to a personal intelligence that helps them make sense of the world around them, makes them smarter. And, you know, in general, I think that's going to drive one of the greatest periods of productivity in the history of our species. I mean, if you just think about it for a moment, everything in your line of sight at this very moment is the product of intelligence, our ability to absorb information, digest it, process it, and then make predictions about how the world might unfold so that we can intervene on those potential trajectories to make things better, you know, make things more comfortable, make things more entertaining, make things more useful. Um, and we're now taking the essence of that process and distilling it into an algorithm. Um, and that's what's coming over the next few decades. You talk in the book about the potential for AI to really help to solve some of our biggest challenges, whether it's climate change, health, mental health, education, what does that mean in practice? What are you most excited about in terms of AI's potential for good? Well, in every area of work, we make predictions all day long. If you're a doctor and you're reading uh, radiology scans and you're trying to make diagnoses, you're making a prediction about how a set of pixels in an image might correspond to a future uh, experience or a diagnosis that a particular patient needs. Uh, likewise, in education, you're making predictions about the best way to present an idea in the most engaging and personalized way to inspire a student to absorb the information, be able to retain it and use it in useful ways in the future. So in every setting, we essentially make predictions as humans. And what this technology offers is a more efficient, ultimately very cheap way to make very accurate predictions in many, many different settings. Your new company, uh, Inflection AI, has just raised over a billion dollars. Could you talk a little bit about your vision for Inflection? And you know, if it makes good on that vision, what will the positive impact for the world be? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I, I think over the next few decades, there are going to be many, many millions of AIs, just as there are millions of apps in the App Store, and there are probably tens of millions uh, or more websites, right? And this is the new modality, uh, conversation, interactive exchanges with intelligent agents are going to become the primary way that we get business done in the world, that we learn things that we, you know, as I say, reach medical diagnoses and manage care in hospitals. And I think that everybody is going to want and need their own personal AI, a personal intelligence. You know, ours is called Pi. And we believe that, you know, having an intelligent personal assistant on your side and in your corner, getting to know you as an individual over time is going to be an amazing experience. It won't just help you to be more organized, um, you know, but it will also help you to be more creative, be more empathetic, uh, generally be smarter and, you know, keep up to speed with all the things that you care about from hobbies to entertainment to news to adult education. And it's going to be incredibly cheap, you know, really radically cheap. Uh, just in the last year, access to the largest models, AI models in the world, language models, has come down in cost by 100x. And over the next few you know, years or so, I expect that to continue 10x, 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 getting much, much cheaper. And that's going to be a radical transformation because it means that you're not going to have to spend vast sums of money for an expensive education, you know, we're going to be able to provide that to everybody in the world. Just as today, everybody in the more developed world um, has access to the most advanced smartphone and laptop, regardless of whether you are a billionaire or you uh, earn minimum wage. Broadly speaking, you get access to the same really high quality hardware. We're on exactly the same trajectory with respect to access to intelligence. In the book, you're very balanced. You talk about the positive potential of AI. You also cover some of the risks. So if we talk about those risks, what are your worst fears and how quickly do you see those manifesting themselves? I think that over the last few years, 
some people have characterized the threats as the, the, the possibility that these models will continue to be biased or that they will produce inaccurate information. Um, I think that is um, a misframing of the problem. I think the problem is almost the opposite. These models are going to get so good. They're going to be so accurate. They're going to be so convincing um, that um, they will essentially enable people who have bad intentions to sow dissent and instability and try to, you know, spread misinformation in our world. They're now going to have an easier time of doing it. I mean, essentially what these models do is they compress power. They take knowledge from the entire history of you know, human experience, most of what has been written down on the open web, and they compress that into a very small transferable AI model, what's known as a set of weights, which can be easily copied and reproduced and moved around and can be fine-tuned or reshaped or you know controlled essentially to pursue any purpose you like. And on the face of it, that's a really amazing thing because it means that everybody is going to get access to an assistant, a chief of staff, a research aide, a tutor, you know, a high quality doctor. Um, that's going to be the most democratic moment in the history of our species. Super meritocratic. Everyone's going to get access. But at the same time, it will mean people who, you know, want to destabilize our world have an easier time of being able to do that because they now have this sort of compressed tool for having influence um, in their pocket. And that's the real regulation challenge that we have to focus on. What chance do governments have of constraining AI, though, without access to the, the vast pools of capital required for the best engineering talent who really understand these black boxes? Well, governments have plenty of capital. The question is how they spend it. And uh, as I've been saying for many years, governments have to spend money on engineering. Um, and that means they have to hire the best uh, engineering talent, which means that they have to wrap their their heads around the idea of paying market rate. It doesn't make any sense that we have an open labor market. And on the one side, you have salaries at five or 10 or even 20x what is paid in the public sector. And over many decades, there's no way you can expect those two types of organizations to be on par with one another, private companies and, and, and big governments. That doesn't make any sense. There's going to be an obvious talent, you know, misleveling. And so governments have to address that issue if we want to have strong, capable, high quality, you know, government administration over the next few decades. I mean, I think people don't often make... Um, plans over the long term with, you know, with, with, with the right kinds of investments. I mean, you know, this has been degrading for many decades now. Um, and it's an investment that we have to make and we have to stop the taboo around paying people more than the prime minister. It just makes absolutely no sense. The second thing is that we have to invest in public infrastructure. I mean, governments have to own their own models. They have to train their own models. They have to really deeply understand um, what is happening. And in my opinion, the way to do that is not just by commissioning, which I think is the habit that people have got into or governments have got into in the last few decades. Commissioning isn't sufficient. You can't commission third parties to build everything for you. You have to build it yourself. That's the best way to understand it. Uh, and then thirdly, you have to have senior um, engineers and, and, and technical leaders in every major position of government both in cabinet and in all the major areas and in major departments of the civil service. Um, it's kind of remarkable that we live in such a digitized world and we, we, we don't really have, you know, a very deep bench on the government side. So I think there's that there are some very practical and obvious things that governments need to do to be able to participate properly in, in, the, in the correct regulation here. Who do you think does that best at the moment in terms of a nation state? Um, um, Israel, South Korea, um, um, frankly, the UAE, um, Singapore, obviously there are, there's a pattern to those countries in that they're all relatively small, um, and they have their own kind of national motivations for, you know, driving their kind of urgent, you know, desire to adapt and evolve and so on. 
Um, you know, but but clearly the big the big failures are you know the U.S., the U.K., many of the big European countries, um, and you know we're just behind the times. And now is the moment to catch up. I think the last sort of twelve months or so, at least in the U.K., has been a bright spot. Um, you know, people are taking seriously the threats and opportunities of AI, which is good. And there's a big summit coming up and people are making investments and so on. So I think, you know, we're headed in the right direction, but we're starting from a pretty, you know, janky baseline. How far behind the US are China on AI? I don't think China is very far behind in terms of AI development. I think people consistently misrepresent China's creativity and engineering capability. They have been a major contributor to AI research uh, in the academic literature for many years now. They've trained some of the largest models um, in the last few. Obviously, we can't really verify their quality, but they're certainly, you know, at the cutting edge or thereabouts. Um, and, you know, I, th I think just in the last few weeks, they've actually released quite a few significant open source models um, and a number in China, too. And again, you know, many people said, well, they're going to uh, be behind because they have to censor the models. Again, it's just a misframing of the problem here. The, the problem is not one of bias or, you know, hallucinations or not being able to censor these models. It's the opposite. It's, it's that we are going to be able to design very, very nuanced, specific, you know, precise capabilities, and they will work as intended. It's not that they're going to, you know, learn their own agency or have their own autonomy or suddenly emerge new capabilities and get out of control. This Terminator framing has been extremely unhelpful and very distracting from what is otherwise a very predictable trajectory of models getting incrementally better and with each order of magnitude and scale getting easier to control. And as they get easier to control, you can direct them to specific use cases. In the case of China, you know, there's their general purpose models, which do all the things that our general models do, but they obviously, you know, are probably quite censored. We're joined at Giant Ideas in the audience by a number of political leaders. If we regulate AI too aggressively in the West to protect society, do you worry that we will fall behind the likes of China? And what's the solution to that dilemma? I think it's a, another misframing, just as the Terminator scenario is a misframing. The idea of being ahead or falling behind is, in my opinion, just not the nature of technology. I mean, te technology is not a, a race between two or three major parties. It's not a race at all. There's no finish line. There's no moment when we get far enough ahead that we can declare victory and, you know, sort of bank that win. Uh, there's hopefully not a moment when we get far enough ahead that we decide to use that strategic advantage in aggressive ways to, you know, sort of attack or, or damage the other side. Um, you know, what's much more likely, and I think the evidence, the historical evidence supports this, and I actually investigate this in some detail in my book, is that there is going to be proliferation by default. Things get easier and cheaper to use to the extent that they are useful to people. Everybody wants access, right? And that drives new efficiencies in production, and that in itself spreads proliferation. So the primary battle that nation states are going to fight, in my opinion, should not be with one another. It should be against the proliferation of power, right? And that's why we need containment, because these aren't just regular sort of technologies like washing machines. They're technologies which are general purpose enablers of all sorts of other activity. And that fundamentally, if that is left unchecked, that represents, in my opinion, a threat to the future of the nation state, at least over a couple decades, not, not tomorrow or certainly not today. Mustafa, if you could turn back the clock magically, would you close the Pandora's box that you opened with DeepMind? And if you could somehow stop the other pioneers of that generation, or ultimately, do you think AI's positive potential will outweigh the harms? Definitely not. This is going to be the most productive few decades in the history of our species. Everything is about to get massively cheaper. I mean, we are going to be having to contend with radical abundance by 2050. You know, energy is going to be seismically cheaper. Food is going to be massively cheaper. It will be easier to grow, you know, crops in drought resistant environments that are pet, pest resistant. We will have all sorts of new biological and, um, you know, chemical compounds, which, 
you know, from ranging from drugs to construction materials, which satisfy our objectives on reducing costs of carbon, you know, and are just easier to use and 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 more productive the world over. So, I, I'm I'm a huge optimist about the potential that it can do, and I I don't think that you know once again I think the metaphor of putting it back in the box or whatever is just a incorrect framing. It's it's a it's a question that misunderstands the nature of technology. Technology isn't a race and it isn't something that can be put back in a box. There is no box and it's not being put back. It's technology naturally by default proliferates. And the challenge for us is to try to shape it with regulation. And in this case, if we end up being a little bit precautionary that is, we over-regulate ahead of time and we look back and say, oh, well, we got it a few years ahead of time. And that meant that we sort of for, you know, we we we, ha- we gave up on some of the potential benefits that we could have you know, had a few years earlier. I think that's OK. I mean, self-driving cars is a perfect example here. Um, you know, I imagine that self-driving cars will have to have a lower um, you know, crash rate than a regular human. If the bar was set a human, we would probably be closer to a, a larger scale deployment than we currently are. So our standards for technology are actually higher with every new generation of technology, and they're higher than what we expect with humans themselves. I mean, you know, medical error in hospitals is one of the biggest causes of death. I think it's the top three cause of death once you're in admission, just straight up error, not adhering to a, a known protocol. So, you know, the, 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 the quality of our own human performance is incredibly low. And yet what we expect from AIs and software and technology introductions is, is much, much higher. So we already have a precautionary principle in, in our approach. We certainly have that with the regulation of drugs, for example. And that's a good thing in general. We shouldn't think of it as over-regulation. We should just think of it as the sensible introduction of new technologies. Mustafa, that's fantastic. An inspiring call to action, but also a very practical one to end on. Thank you so much again for joining us at Giant Ideas. It's a pleasure. Cheers, Tommy. Glad to be here.